honored to be introduced by uh, Sal. He was uh, one of my uh, heroes in the field of personality psychology, which is my specialty area. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, there was a lot of internal uh, squabble and debate in the field of personality. People really uh, wondering if personality even existed anymore. And uh, people were thinking about uh, closing up shop and uh, uh, changing uh, allegiances and so forth. And Sal, along with probably uh, a handful of others, two, three, four at the most, uh, were largely responsible for resurrecting the field of, of personality and saving it. So I was always uh, grateful, as well as many of my cohort, uh, for the, the work that Sal did, the field of personality. So we owe him gratitude. And the gratitude is a topic, uh, coincidentally, uh, of my talk today. Gratitude, a slight change in title from what uh, I gave uh, for the program, but also uh, slightly more accurate uh, uh, as well. I'm going to take this off. You know who I am, right? You see, I bought a new tie just for this conference. And the problem is these things, they, they cover up your tie. And I think it, it kind of works, so I want to I wear it. Anyway, show it off. So I'll, I'll leave that there uh, for now. Uh, let me start with a quote. Uh, which uh, came from a person who was a technology consultant for an investment firm whose offices were housed in the South Tower of the World Trade Center. The person said the following, when the second plane hit the South Tower of the World Trade Center, I had just stepped out of an elevator onto the 44th floor. Dust and rubble burst out of the elevator shafts and stairways. There was a lot of panic. I clung to the need to see and to feel God's love. The descent down the stairwells was orderly and efficient. So many people were actively expressing love for one another, helping them, calming their fears, embracing and comforting them. It sounds strange, but one of my abiding impressions was how much there was to be grateful for and how many people to be grateful to. Things got worse for a time when the towers collapsed. I was a block away. I was able to keep somewhat focused on the need to love and be grateful. I thought it was very interesting that of all the emotions one was feeling at a time like this, the person would have chose to focus on love and gratitude. Certainly not the reaction I would have had in that situation at the time. And it strikes me then that, that gratefulness and gratitude is a very interesting, probably very complex emotion that shows up a lot of times in some of the strangest places where you would least uh, expect it. Psychologists have done a very good job of studying gratitude. My colleagues and I reviewed the literature on gratitude a couple of years ago, and we found no more than a handful of studies on, uh, on the topic. Even emotion theorists who you think would study gratitude as a basic uh, well, not a basic emotion using their criteria, but at least as an important human feeling by and large, have failed to explore the contours of gratitude. Uh, I've studied gratitude for many reasons. I'll get into some of my motivations uh, throughout the talk. I don't consider myself an expert on gratitude. I've only been studying it for a few years. Still basically a novice on the topic of gratitude, but it's one that I think is extremely important. But it's been understudied, undervalued, and underappreciated by psychologists. Yeah, I think it's very important, in fact, essential uh, for understanding well-being, quality of life, optimal functioning, happiness, subjective well-being, some of the concepts and constructs that I've been interested in for the last 20 years ago, or 20 years or so since I've been in graduate school. What I want to do the first part of the talk is talk about what gratitude is and look at different perspectives. Although psychologists haven't had much to say about it, others have. Philosophers, theologians, so forth, look at some of these other perspectives, and then talk about some research in the second half of the talk that I've been doing, conducting on uh, the psychology of gratitude, seeing if uh, uh, gratitude is, a, is a, um, a quality that actually can be actively practiced in people's lives, and if so, what possible outcomes or effects could there be in other aspects of, of people's functioning. Well, typically, if I ask you what uh, what do you mean by gratitude, or what does it feel like to be grateful? You can think of a prototypical situation. 
that someone provides you with a benefit or a gift and the response is one of appreciation or thankfulness or gratefulness. So a minimal definition of gratitude. Is that bright enough? Can you see that background okay? I hate it when it's too dull, you know, kind of put you to sleep. The emotional response to a gift, all right, uh, which, um, just think about it for a moment, is not really sufficient because all kinds of responses you might have to a gift. Okay? So the philosopher Bob Roberts talks about, well, what if someone gives you a velvet Elvis, which is framed in Brazilian rosewood with built-in lighting that you have to display in your home because that person frequently visits you. You know, and so you hate the gift, right? And, uh, but you should express, you should be grateful or thankful that they have uh, given that to you. Well, you might feel some gratitude, but probably mix with other sorts of emotions as well. So you need more than just the response to a gift, because all sorts of responses one can make to a gift. And there's all sorts of dynamics between gifts and givers that uh, make the situation a bit more complex. So one could define it as an inner sense or attitude of some of appreciation for some benefit received. So here the idea is now you perceive there to be a benefit. Okay, there's some, some uh, 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 kindness or good thing that someone has provided you with. There's more to it than this. You place a value on what they've given to you. It's important to you. You recognize they intended to benefit you. That you perceive there's some cost in that person's um, uh, behalf that they have incurred to give this debt to you. So the situation gets a little bit more complex. Two of my favorite definitions of what gratitude is uh, come from philosophers. So Bertachkin Miller, uh, actually Miller, that's uh, uh, spelling's incorrect, wrote in a book called Personality in the Good, 1963, that gratitude is the willingness to recognize the unearned increments of value in one's experience unearned increments of value. The idea is being that we are grateful for things we didn't necessarily warrant. Things are given to us freely without uh, strings attached. Okay? We didn't necessarily deserve them. Undeserved merit, the idea is here. And so uh, Robert Solomon, philosopher, st uh, specializes in the philosophy of emotion, said that gratitude is an estimate of gain coupled with the judgment that someone else is responsible for that gain. So we give credit to someone else for positive outcomes that happen to us. It's a recognition that other people are at least partly responsible for the good things, the benefits that uh, we have. Okay. Now, so there's largely an interpersonal component so far. We get a gift, benefit, we acknowledge that we feel gratitude. But there's other meanings as well. So 40 years ago, George Nachnicki, a philosopher, wrote a chapter where he talked about vast thankfulness that cannot be expressed to any human being. Uh, nowadays, uh, there's a whole literature out there on uh, religious naturalism. So throughout the years, centuries, uh, 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 religious emotions like awe, wonder, reverence, gratitude have been felt in response to the beauty and majesty of nature uh, uh, or to human nature, such as the birth of a child. So that's my son when he was uh, five days old. Uh, he's five years old, looks a little bit uh, bigger now. But it's kind of the kind of awe feeling wonder that you have when you see the birth of a newborn a uh, child elicits these sorts of feelings. People will talk about gratitude, feeling grateful in a situation like this. If not the birth of a child, then maybe the birth of a star. So here's the birth of a, of a star. On the left-hand side, uh, you see a little star in the, in the box, and then it's magnified. Hubble telescope gave great images from the Hubble telescope on the Internet. Uh, so looking up at a starry sky at night can elicit feelings of awe, wonder, and some sense of gratitude. Well, this is the religious or cosmic gratitude that uh, Nachnikian and others have spoken of, or that Ursula Goodenough speaks of a biologist at Washington University in St. Louis in her book, The Sacred Depths of Nature. She says, we are moved to awe and wonder at the grandeur, the richness of natural beauty. It fills us with joy 
and thanksgiving. So here the meaning of gratitude is a little bit different than being handed a gift and saying thank you. It's, it's, there's no one person in particular that you are thanking. The commonality is that it's always uh, reflected in the benefit received from another moral being or moral agent. We're not grateful to ourselves. It's not like anger or other emotions. You can be happy uh, toward yourself. You can feel pride. You can get angry at yourself. Uh, but it would be very unusual to say, I'm grateful to myself. Right? That would be uh, kind of bizarre. Even if, you know, your birthday is coming up and you buy yourself a gift because you want to be sure you get the right thing. You're not sure someone else is going to get it for you. So you go to the mall. You take the shower from the hotel. Go to the mall, like I did yesterday morning. And you buy something for yourself. But you don't feel gratitude to yourself. You don't thank yourself for getting this gift for yourself. See, it doesn't make any sense that way. So the, there's always an other involved in gratitude. The moral philosophers, going back a couple thousand years to modern times, have spoken of gratitude as well, have said some very profound things about it. So Cicero, for instance, believed that gratitude was not only the greatest of the virtues, but the parent of all the others. I could have put a lot of quotes up here from moral philosophers who just happened to choose uh, this one. The Buddha said, a, a noble person is mindful and grateful of the favors that others do uh, for him. Similarly, harsh words have been directed against the ungrateful. Kant said that the essence of vileness is ingratitude. Uh, and so uh, there's a long history. Now, not every uh, theolo not every philosophical system of the virtues has gratitude in there, but a good many of them do, many times as an element of justice, a secondary virtue associated with justice. It was in the system of Thomas Aquinas. We turn to theology, we see lots and lots of emphasis on gratitude, thanksgiving across religions, across world religions whether you look at Hebrew religion, Christian religion, or Islam, let's start with the monotheistic religions, you see it over and over again as a central core theme, a universal religious uh, emotion. Okay, I don't have time to review uh, all of this, but in, in Hebrew scripture, read the Psalms, I mean, saturated with language of praise and thanksgiving. And, uh, in Christianity, uh, there's entire theological systems uh, developed that are really based in the notion of, of thanksgiving, uh, doxology, uh, praise. Uh, the word gratitude or thank, thankfulness occurs 150 times in the Old and New Testaments uh, combined. So it's a major uh, theme. So it is in Islam as well. 74 times in the Quran you see thanking or it's one of its cognates, 74 times. And it reaches its culmination in Sufism, which is the mystical branch of Islam, where gratitude, becoming grateful, is actually a, a high, higher stage in spiritual development, it's a sign of uh, spiritual uh, maturity, the ability to become grateful or uh, thankful. So just as an example, John Wesley, uh, founder, later founder of Methodism, said that true religion is right tempers, right feelings toward God and man. It is, in two words, gratitude and benevolence. Gratitude to our creator and supreme benefactor and benevolence to our fellow creatures. Well, here you have two uh, 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 biblical themes, canon-wide themes of justice okay, and righteousness. Righteous before God, just before others, calls gratitude and benevolence. So it's a theme that comes up again and again as one does, a, as uh, Dr. Gandhi said the other night, a friendly study of the religions. You see this as a, uh, as a, uh, a, a core, uh, universal uh, theme. Now, one could wonder, is it just the monotheistic religions that posit uh, a benevolent uh, creator that commend gratitude, or is it encouraged in other uh, theological, not theological, that wouldn't be the right word, it was about God, other uh, world religions as well. Okay. Well, no they don't. Okay. For instance, here's a quote 
from, uh, attributed to uh, the Buddha, who said, let us rise up and be thankful, for if we didn't learn a lot today, at least we learned a little. Of course, we're all learning a lot, right, at this conference. Uh, if we didn't learn a little, at least we didn't get sick. And if we got sick, at least we didn't die. Uh, I guess nowadays you'd say, you'd say you know, well, uh, maybe the stock market went down 400 points, but it didn't go to zero, that kind of thing. Uh, so let us all be uh, thankful. There's always something, there seems to be a malleability to thankfulness or uh, gratitude, which could be quite independent of circumstances, uh, as we'll uh, see. So, there's also Buddhism, one can look at Buddhism and, and uh, 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 other uh, religions, Shintoism and so forth, and still look at the importance of gratitude as an important uh, element of, uh, of life. Well, I looked to psychologists to see what they had to say about gratitude. As I mentioned earlier, not a heck of a lot. Uh, one who did talk about gratitude, though, was the humanistic, transpersonal psychologist Abraham Maslow, especially toward the end of his career, although you can find the writing uh, a little bit in some other areas, particularly when he talks about the peak experience or self-actualizers, these uh, uh, highly um, uh, optimal functioning individuals. He saw the ability to be grateful, or to appreciate life, appreciate blessings without having to undergo their actual loss, he saw as a core feature, characteristic of self-actualizing uh, individuals. He said it's vital, it's really the essence that people count their blessings, appreciate what they possess without having to undergo its actual loss. And he writes in his book, Religions, Values, and Peak Experiences, People during and after peak experiences characteristically feel lucky, fortunate, graced. Common reaction is, I don't deserve this. A common consequence is a feeling of gratitude in religious persons to their God and others to fate or nature, just good fortune. This can go over to worship, giving thanks, adoring, giving praise, oblation, which is uh, offering, and other reactions which fit very easily into orthodox religious framework. So here we have uh, Maslow show, uh, stating that gratitude is a concept which not only transcends religions, but also perhaps is at that nexus between spirituality and religion that a lot of people like to debate the difference between them. Well, gratitude uh, is a concept which is equally at home in both of those um, frameworks. Okay, a uh, couple more perspectives. One of my uh, favorite writers is uh, G.K. Chesterton, a very prolific writer, wrote over a hundred books of uh, various sorts, the beginning of uh, uh, the 20th uh, century. It was described as one of the most influential writers of the 20th century. A couple of quotes attributed to him, the test of all happiness is gratitude. And by this, I think he meant that uh, Show me a happy person, I'll show you a grateful person. It's, it's impossible to be truly happy, authentically happy, without being uh, grateful. Gratitude has produced the most purely joyful moments that have been known to men. Well, people who knew Chesterton described him as exuberant, exhilarated by life. Joy, he talked about, he wrote about. Well, you can see, it looks pretty joyful in this picture, right? <laughs> well, no, it, it looks a little cranky in this picture. Um, so I thought to myself, well, gosh, if everyone says he's such a happy, joyful, exuberant, exhilarated guy, uh, why is it that, you know, most of the pictures of him kind of look like uh, has this kind of mood uh, on his face? So I looked around to see some, if I could find somewhere showing some more of this uh, enthusiasm or joy that he's supposed to be known for. Uh, I found one where he was a little bit more joyful than he was in the previous one. Oh, well, it doesn't really still get there, right? There's still something missing, so dug around a little bit more, I did find one where you really start to see, the, you know, the gratitude. There it is, okay. So, pretty joyful guy, right? Um, gratitude was his way of life, he wrote in his autobiography. If there's one principle I would like to have taught, he said it was uh, gratitude. And he, here's an example. He's writing a letter to his fiancée at the time, uh, Frances. 
and he's using a, you know, an ink pen, and he spills some of the ink. And then he starts, he gets distracted, starts talking about the ink, right? And he says, I like the ink, it's so inky. I do not think there's anyone who takes quite, quite such fierce pleasure in things being themselves as I do. The startling wetness of water excites and intoxicates me. The fieriness of fire, the steeliness of steel, the unutter unutterable muddiness of mud. Like everything really kind of excited him. He had this childlike sense of awe and wonder uh, uh, for life. He writes uh, in his book, Orthodoxy, the test of all happiness is gratitude. Children are grateful when Santa Claus puts in their stockings gifts of toys or sweets. Could I, could I not be grateful to Santa Claus when he puts in my stockings the gift of two miraculous legs? We thank people for birthday presents. Can I thank no one for the birthday present of birth? He writes, he was just filled with, with this gratitude and uh, seemed to live his life in a, under an awe of pervasive thankfulness. Okay, so, quotes, quotes are nice. There's one more quote. Uh, nowadays, there's been, recently, a lot of attention drawn to gratitude as important uh, 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 concept, uh, important practice that people can engage in. We're looking for developing a more spiritually meaning life. Uh, most of whom got some publicity uh, on Oprah, such as uh, Sarah Brethnak, whose book, Simple Abundance Journal of Gratitude, has sold about a million copies. And the me general message of books like this is that really the key to life is to become more grateful. She is the most passionate, transformative force in the cosmos. And there's other quotes like this I could show you from other uh, uh, more popular books on gratitude, where gratitude is really kind of seen as the panacea for everything. Uh, things are going badly and, uh, emotionally, physically, interpersonally, your job, you become more grateful, right? And that's kind of the key uh, to life. Well, these are very extreme statements, and we need to test these uh, experimentally if there's to be any value of them. We need to evaluate them in an appropriate, in, in, uh, in an appropriate uh, way. Well, Charles Dickens had an idea how to do this. He said we should reflect on the present blessings of which we all have many, not on your past misfortunes of which all men have some. Uh, if you wonder what that picture is, it's, it's kind of hard to find a picture of Charles Dickens on the Internet. So this is the Charles Dickens pub in Victoria, down the road in Victoria, right? Uh, so that kind of works, right, Dickens <laughs> pub? Now, next I want you to do, this is now the uh, uh, experiential part of the session. I want you to think about five things that have happened since this conference began for which you are grateful. Okay? It could be things that other people did for you, in which case you could mention a person uh, who provided you with some benefit that you're grateful for. It could be... Uh, not a person at all. It could be just something that happened from the time you got here, or let's say the time you left your home, to right this moment. Five things that you're grateful or thankful for. You can think about that or you can jot them down uh, for just a couple of minutes. And then we'll, then we'll move on. And that winds up being a little tactic I can use to get my glass of water, which I forgot to bring to the front of the room when I started. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is what we ask our research participants to do the same thing. In our uh, experiments we've been conducting uh, over the past few, we've, been, we've done three studies now, three experiments. We have people do just this. We ask them to write down on a daily basis 
uh, up to five things for which they're grateful or thankful uh, in one condition. Okay, they do that. They're randomly assigned to conditions. So here's the methodology uh, right here. This is the first study that we did. We took 200 participants and we randomly assigned them to one of the three conditions. First, we had the gratitude group. So you're lucky, you're all in the gratitude group, okay? And you write down five things in your life that you're grateful or thankful for. And most people are in trouble coming up with uh, five of these. But then there's a second condition. We randomly assign people so that some one-third get in the second condition, which is the hassles group, or what we call the whining and complaining group. And they write down up to five things that went wrong uh, during the day or uh, during the week. Okay, that's the hassles group. And then we have a, a third group, control group. In this particular case, it was a neutral events group. They wrote, we asked them to write down up to five major events and circumstances that Im impacted them. It was a mixture. Some wrote good stuff, pleasant. Some wrote unpleasant. When we quoted them later, they were pretty much came out half positive, half, uh, actually one-third positive, one-third negative, one-third pretty neutral. While they were doing this, they were keeping weekly records, diaries, logs of their moods, 30 different uh, mood adjectives they rated, uh, life appraisals, optimism, pessimism, uh, how, delighted, terrible, how's your life going as a whole? What do you expect the upcoming day or week to be like? Do you expect the best or do you expect the worst? Uh, physical symptoms, the typical uh, physical symptoms uh, that are uh, surveyed, headaches, backaches, um, that sort of thing. And health behaviors like exercise. And they did this once a week for 10 weeks in the first uh, study. Okay. At the end of the 10 weeks, we compare, we average the ratings on the well-being outcome measures at the bottom and see if there's a difference between the three groups. Not real profound stuff, right? It's not really rocket science. It's pretty uh, simple, almost embarrassingly simple to do research like this, but still it's interesting. And, you know, you don't know what to expect. You might think, well, sure, the gratitude group is going to show better moods and so forth than the other three groups, but who knows? It's a minimal intervention. They do this once a week. They write down five things. Do you really expect it's going to have an impact? There's all sorts of factors out there that influence mood, personality, the weather, uh, you know, life events, and so forth. How can you really expect to move people's moods around when there is this baseline level of mood? People have a set point of happiness, right? Research tells us some people are by nature happier and some people are by nature unhappier. Can you really move them around from a minimal intervention like this? Uh, well, let's see what, what we did. Let's look at some uh, examples first. Here would be some examples of hassles. Your typical garden variety types of hassles, parking, finances, exams. These were college students, uh, by the way. Having a horrible test in health psychology, somebody mentioned, which I felt kind of bad since I was teaching that class at the time. Um, rude customers on a Sunday morning, uh, doing a favor for a friend who didn't appreciate it, so lack of gratitude to someone else was, was seen as a hassle. What about the gratitudes, or these uh, uplifts, or benefits, blessings, whatever you want to call them? What sort of things did people mention? Wide variety. Uh, of different uh, things were mentioned here. Just waking up, people were grateful for that. Generosity of friends, warmth of family to God, to parents, what I've learned. Uh, someone had been to a concert the night before uh, to the Rolling Stones, so they said they were grateful to the Rolling Stones, who are, by the way, going on tour again, so you still have a chance to see them. Uh, it's nice to know there'd always be someone older than you performing on stage, right? No matter how old we get to be, uh, that they'll be up there. All right. Ha uh, hassles, gratitude. You get the idea, right? So they're writing these lists every day, every day, or every week. We want to see what happens to them after 10 weeks. Well, what we found was relative to the other two groups, the gratitude, people in the gratitude condition, they tended to feel better about their lives as a whole. I'll show you the next slide. I'll have data on it. Felt better about their lives as a whole. They were more optimistic about the upcoming week. They reported fewer physical health complaints. 
they actually, this was the most surprising finding, they actually spent more time exercising, spent an hour and a half more per week exercising than the ones in the other group, especially in the, compared to the Hassel's condition, that was your biggest difference there, for uh, about four and a half hours to three hours, so that's a whopping difference, an hour and a half, uh, especially for me, I don't exercise at all, so you know, anything is a lot, an hour and a half is really a lot. I tried it once, but it made me tired, so I stopped exercising. Okay. And they also said they had made more progress toward life goals. We asked them, this was a separate uh, study going on simultaneously, we asked them to write down five goals, projects they want to accomplish in the next two and a half months, which is the length of our academic quarter at Davis. Then after that 10 weeks ended, we asked them, go back, okay, tell us how much progress had you actually made on those goals? Self-perceived progress, admittedly. Well, it turns out the ones in the grad two group perceived they actually made more progress toward their goals than the ones in the other two uh, conditions. Uh, the data look like this. So life as a whole, there you see it, um, seven point scale. Upcoming week, life as a whole went from terrible to delighted. Upcoming week, pessimistic, expect the worst, optimistic, expect the best. Fewer physical symptoms, more there's the exercise finds, actually an hour and a third more uh, uh, per uh, week. And then the last line is just to show you that the manipulation worked. Actually, they were more grateful, appreciative, and thankful, three adjectives we use on the uh, weekly form to measure the sense of uh, gratitude. So it seemed to be some benefits in study one. We wanted to know if these benefits would uh, be, could be replicated, maybe even stronger if we did a stronger study. So instead of having people do it once a week, we said, well, let's do it every day. So in the second study, we did it every day for three weeks, no, sorry, two weeks, 14 days. Once again, grad two group, Hassel's group. Now the second study, we introduced a different third condition. We had them engage in a downward social comparison. We asked them, write down five ways in which you're better off than someone else. We were concerned about demand characteristics. You're just asking people write about good things. Well then, sure, they're gonna have uh, show some improvement on some of these other ratings that you're having them do. Let's create a condition which on the surface looks to be positive, downward comparison, but in reality might activate some other feelings such as pride or, or sympathy toward others that wouldn't have the same benefits as gratitude. We asked them about pro-social activities, helping others, offering emotional support, as well as the health and well-being outcomes. Basically what we found here was very different from study one. We found that gratitude led to more activation-based positive states. People who were in the grateful condition reported being more active, energetic, alert. This is positive emotions, high engagement, uh, approach-related feelings, attentive, determined, interested. We found in this study no effect at all for exercise or illness symptoms. So we've got the psychological effect but not a physical effect in study two. We also found though a uh, an effect on helping others. So they felt more altruistic in the gratitude condition. They actually said they had spent more time, they were more likely to have helped someone with a personal problem if they were in the gratitude condition versus the other two conditions. So one thing we saw benefits, not entirely replicating study two, but still interesting in their own right. Well, then we did a third study. There's only 29 studies, by the way, so we're doing good. We're, we should make it. Uh, those are the last study. Gratitude and people were with chronic disease. First two studies were with pretty healthy college students. Third study, we looked at people with neuromuscular disease. I'm doing some work with people in the med school at Davis, and they have a, pro a project on quality of life in people with neuromuscular disease. So I was able to um, uh, solicit the help of 140 of these uh, individuals from around the country various forms of neuromuscular disease. By the way, these are diseases where there's muscular weakening, pain, uh, degeneration, over 300 different diseases. Post-polio disease is probably one of the best known ones. There's others uh, as well. Overall prevalence, about 4 million in the United States. And they have a big um, clinic, neuromuscular disease clinic at the medical uh, center at, uh, uh, at Davis. 
Well, we randomly assigned them to three groups. The gratitude thoughts, which are the same gratitude condition as the first two studies. A thoughts plus expression condition, we asked them write down what you're grateful for and who you're grateful to. We thought that might have an added benefit, focusing not on just the gift, but also the giver behind the gift. And then we didn't do a hassles condition. We thought, you know, chronic pain, we don't want to mess up these people anymore by having them focus on um, hassles. So we just had a true control group with no ratings at all. Uh, just the emotional, physical, and social well-being over a three-week time frame. So there's every day for three weeks were our dependent uh, variables. Findings, pretty similar, replicating previous uh, study, study number two, the daily study, more positive emotions, so more alert, more active, more energetic, more attentive, more enthusiastic. No differences on unpleasant feelings, such as anxiety, depression, sadness, anger, they weren't less unhappy, they were just more happy. It affected their positive emotions, but not uh, their negative. Life appraisals, they felt more better, felt more better, felt better about their life as a whole, more optimistic. They felt more connected to others. We included that <coughs> because that's an issue with people with neuromuscular disease. A lot of them are isolated, living by themselves, uh, don't feel part of their community. So just writing down that which they were grateful for on a daily basis seemed to increase their feeling, sense of connectedness to others. They actually slept more, half hour more per night. They woke up, they said they were more refreshed from their sleep than those who were in the other conditions. Once again, no effect for exercise or no effect for ratings of, subjective ratings of pain, we asked them. So, we see benefits in each of the three studies of a grateful uh, focus. Now, we also, uh, attack the problem of gratitude and well-being from a trait perspective as well. So we developed a questionnaire that measures the grateful disposition, the GQ, a six-item scale. Pretty reliable. Uh, we just published it in JPSB in January of this year. Uh, it uh, gets at various facets of the grateful disposition. There's one factor to it. Uh, I'll skip over some of those other uh, details. Here's the items, six items uh, on the GQ. Strongly disagree to strongly agree. How much you're thankful for, uh, the list, how long a list would it be if you made a gratitude list. A grateful person will have, of course, a longer list than a less grateful person. What do you see when you look at the world? Is there much to be grateful for? How many people are you grateful to? The kind of the, the, um, the breadth of gratitude, you're grateful just to one person or just to your parents or to no one or to God, plus a bunch of other people, uh, uh, moral agents. So people are different in the breadth of those to whom they're grateful for. And then frequency, something like number six, how much time goes by before you feel grateful to something or someone. Scale works pretty well. We found basically that it correlates positively with things that it ought to, with like things like empathy, social desirability, agreeableness, peer reports of pro-social behavior. Though. So the friends of grateful people say that these people are more helpful, more uh, pro-social than people who are less grateful. Correlates with both spirituality as well as traditional religious involvement. Uh, in fact, it just correlates just as highly with a Trait measure of spirituality, which you think it would because it would share method variance, and that tends to augment a correlation, as it does with a simple rating, one of the Duke University scales, how religious are you, one to five, correlates just as strongly with uh, gratitude as uh, does the spirituality measure, more um, complex spirituality measure. So both religion and spirituality correlate with gratitude. Negatively with materialism and envy. So grateful people are less materialistic, less envious than less grateful individuals. It's not reducible to the big five traits. And it's also associated with vitality, life satisfaction, hope, and optimism. So it, it seems to relate to those good things that it, uh, that it ought to. So one can use this as a measure in research. If you want a trait measure of gratitude, the GQ6 is a nice, short, reliable scale that we hope uh, people will use, or in epidemiological studies of health, spirituality, religion, throw in the GQ, you have a measure of an important aspect of religious experience. Uh, religion is much more than just 
a belief. It's also about feelings, emotions, like gratitude. And so I think it's one of the reasons why measures of religion tend to correlate with measures of well-being is because of some of these things like hope, love, gratitude, forgiveness. That's a story for another day. Uh, what good is gratitude? Why does it seem to relate to better well-being? Well, a lot of reasons. I think, first of all, it increases one's enjoyment of benefits. Gratitude tends to magnify or maximize the goodness, good feelings that we have. The thing happens, uh, many of us move on to the next goal or task in life without taking time to pause, reflect, appreciate, savor that benefit that we have. So it maximizes one's enjoyment of uh, benefits. Second, it can provide coping skills for dealing with loss and stress. So it's not surprising, as uh, Rich Tedeschi talked about uh, yesterday, that gratitude, sense of appreciation, can come about oftentimes through struggles with trauma in the aftermath of uh, adversity. I'll uh, give you an example that many of you are familiar with. So Corey Ten Boom, she's in the concentration camps, right? World War II, what's her reaction? Well, in one case, it's one of gratitude. She tells a story uh, about being grateful for there being fleas in their barracks where they were imprisoned. And the fleas were biting them and so forth, and it's hot and it's, you know, it's awful in there. And it's why is she grateful for the fleas? Well, the fleas apparently kept the guards away. Okay. And the, with the guards not there, they were free to talk amongst themselves. They were fr free to uh, read the Bible amongst themselves and to talk and so forth amongst themselves. So she talked about being grateful uh, for the fleas in one's barracks. So uh, one can be grateful in these extraordinary circumstances, as the, the person whose uh, quote I started to talk with uh, in the World Trade Center. Let's see. Gratitude can be an antidote to upward comparisons, as people make upward comparisons with uh, others who seem to have more money, more prestige, uh, better uh, looks, and so forth. Uh, gratitude can, can be an antidote uh, toward this. Uh, I think uh, the fourth one is also important, mitigating maladaptive uh, self-focus by focusing on uh, those who have contributed to our positive outcomes can take a lot of pressure off oneself uh, for feeling pride solely and giving credit uh, to others, which can be very, uh, very freeing. Okay, so you see, uh, some of these, these are, a lot of these are hypotheses to be tested, but I think gratitude, if it works this way, uh, can be a very effective component of uh, perhaps cognitive behavioral interventions which are designed to deal with things like depression by if it has in fact has these uh, effects. Building community. So not all the benefits are internal or in, intrapersonal. Some of them are interpersonal as well. Sociologists have talked mostly about this. Gratitude is power in building community as the moral cement of society as uh, George Simmel, one sociologist, uh, discussed. Uh, Albert Schweitzer uh, said this. He said, the gratitude that we encounter helps us believe in the goodness of the world and strengthens us thereby to do what is good. It's much more than just kind of personal benefits, feeling better, better health, longevity, whatever. Uh, he's saying that, no, there's, it's a bigger story than that. There's a bigger picture involved here with uh, gratitude. Now, if you like that quote, uh, you can find more. Uh, have, we did a little book last fall, right before Thanksgiving, called Words of Gratitude. Uh, it's a little gift book, $12.95. Uh, they have it on the table outside. Okay. Uh, in fact, it's the best buy on the entire table, even in Canadian dollars. It's still pretty reasonable. So uh, it's a little book that uh, describes some of our research in very accessible terms for the average person and has a lot of quotes like the one from Schweitzer and some of the others that I've been putting up there. Okay, very quickly, if gratitude is so good, why is it so difficult? Well, a lot of people have trouble with the gratitude, right? Well, there's lots of obstacles to it. I don't have time to get into all these. A uh, sense of victimhood, victimology kind of mentality that's, that's running rampant nowadays. sense of entitlement that we deserve all the things that we have, so how can we be grateful for them? Rejection of dependency, okay? 
uh, to say you're grateful means that you're giving credit to other people for what you've accomplished, right? And so some people, especially men, can be very queasy about becoming grateful because it implies that they didn't do it all themselves, right? There's other people uh, to thank that helped them along the way. And so this fear of becoming dependent upon others, I think all these things block our impediments to a sense of gratitude that kind of have to be dealt with and, and worked through. Uh, it's a choice, though. Gratitude is an attitude. Uh, we're not born as grateful individuals. That's why we have to spend so much time trying to teach our children uh, to be thankful. So Henry Nguyen, the priest and psychologist, said that gratitude is, as a discipline is a conscious choice. I can choose to be grateful even when my emotions are steeped in hurt and resentment. It's amazing how many occasions present themselves in which I can choose gratitude instead of a uh, complaint. So it was with this person. Uh, this is a man with Lou Gehrig's disease with ALS. And uh, a spouse. For five years, he's faced with this disease, degenerative disease. It's going to be fatal. He writes these words when the disease has taken most of the life and movement away from his body. He says, I believe that life is not always fair. It certainly has not, it has certainly been true in my case. It is not fair that I should have wonderful, caring, supportive parents who raised me right and brothers and sisters that are there when I need them. It's not fair that I should be, it's not fair that I should be blessed with a beautiful, talented wife and together we should have two equally beautiful, talented daughters who make us proud daily. No, he says, life is not fair. Why should I have had so many years of good health and energy and good friends to camp and backpack with through the years? ALS is a terrible disease, but it does not negate the rest of my life. Uh, I think it's important to point out that gratefulness is not just positive thinking. It's not just a positive thinking veneer. It's not just happyology, as Marty Seligman likes to say. It's not just thinking positive thoughts, but people do express gratitude in the context of adversity and, and difficulty and, uh, 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 and challenge, as this individual did uh, as well. They still have an abiding sense that there is goodness. There are things to be grateful for, even under the devastation of uh, daily life. And why do they do that? Well... Uh, perhaps it's to achieve the state that Melody Beattie talks about from codependency fame. She says, what gratitude does is it unlocks the fullness of life. You think of what the word gratefulness, you could actually, as some people have split into two, great fullness, a life of fullness. It turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos to order, confusion to clarity. It can turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, a stranger into a friend. Gratitude makes sense of our past, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for tomorrow. And I'll leave you with that. I like that quote. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know I overdo it on the quotes so much, but uh, I like them. It's hard to throw them out, you know, because they're powerful uh, expressions of something I think is pretty profound, that is the sense of, of gratefulness. I guess we have some time, right, for some questions, it looks like. Are you saying that most of these are in the book? They're in the book, yeah. No, don't forget the book, right? Okay, whoops. Well, anyway, it's there. <laughs> Well, I just wonder whether the type of the expression of gratefulness differs according to stages of uh, human development. Whatever uh, scheme you take over or whatever. Well, I think so. I think there's a, a development progression to it. I think it requires a degree of uh, uh, maturity. Uh, I don't think one sees it full-blown in children, certainly. Uh, there's different, of course, levels of gratitude. There's gratitude is a habit where you say, learn to say thank you. Uh, then it becomes uh, a disposition, more of an ingrained trait. 
Uh, that's still, uh, still a, a, a few steps away from the kind of gratitude that someone like Chesterton would show, where it's kind of this life orientation, right? The whole life is built around the print, where everything is seen as a gift. You know, it really is a higher level of, uh, of gratitude. And whether at some of the lower level may have a dark side, such as, I'm glad I killed the other guy, and not the other guy killed me. No, oh, yeah. There's a whole other side to gratitude, too. Uh, you know, when you, you read the philosopher, theology it tends to paint it as a very positive, desirable characteristic, but uh, uh, I'm sure some of the hijackers on September 11th had gratitude on their lips as they, you know, flew the airplanes, right? So there's that element, too, to it. Oh, okay. Did not, did not develop as the mystical branch of, of Islam? Oh. Uh, Hassan and I, uh, brought the universal life to the universe of Allah Sufi and brought it to the West in the early 20th century. He now felt all the Sufi order. Mm -hmm. And he, in, for his vision, it was all, it always has been and it always will be. It was before Islam. Oh, okay. And then, in fact, the, the, the I see. I see. I see. Good. Thank you for that. Yeah. The other thing is, where did you find and discover that that is for Sufism, that is uh, gratitude is, is uh, a stage in the journey? Well, you know, uh, I, had a, I had an actual postdoc who was uh, Sufi, and she did a lot of research. Uh, and so I don't know what, you know what particular volume she found that in, but she did, you know, read uh, 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 Ibn Arabi and right in all the, the Sufi masters yeah. and, and found it somewhere. <laughs> Some book essentials of Sufism, I'm sure. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Have you done a study on the comparing uh, your six week and eight week treatment, uh, day treatment with this uh, list compared to antidepressants? No, no, I'd like to do something like that. Uh, Yeah, <laughs> I think, well, I mean, we know that other, other uh, cognitive treatments are effective. You know, I know optimism training uh, seems to be as effective, and the recent review came out and showed that cognitive behavioral therapy is as effective as, uh, as um, uh, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals for treating depression, uh, particularly having uh, longer-term uh, positive benefits, that the drugs work is in, well in the short term, but longer-term because these positive, uh, these kind of treatments kind of build in uh, 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 skills and strengths for later on that will serve the person after they're uh, no longer depressed. No, I like that. In terms of uh, the whole concept of uh, power of the mind to affect uh, well-being, you've probably seen a piece of research about knee surgery that came out recently. Mm -mm. Uh, it was an experiment with uh, some patients who received real knee surgery and others who had a pretend surgery. Oh, the mock knee surgery yeah. was a placebo, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, the outcome was, was the same, basically? So they had, uh, if they were in the placebo group, they had less pain and they would recommend the procedure to others and so forth, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, Richard. Uh, I was wondering if you thought that the writing Uh, I think, yeah, I think it's important to uh, put them down to make them concrete. 
Uh, I think there's benefits to that beyond thinking about it. Uh, I think that cause a person to reflect more uh, about each one. But I don't know, we, 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 we could do a study like that where we have a thinking versus a writing group uh, and see what the so impact would be. But then again, uh, it could also be that, you know, the people become so focused on just keeping a list, they're not really doing it very mindfully either. And you could think about it more mindfully than, uh, let me say, I've, I've never kept a gratitude list, right? Despite what I tell people, yeah, that's off the record, by the way. Uh, but I think about stuff all the time that I'm grateful for, uh, but I never actually write it down. Because I find writing it down, is, it's, it's, uh, it's a burden to sit down and do that. That's hard work. I hate doing it, right? And, uh, uh, you know, it could do, be done in a mindful way, but it could be done as just another chore, in which case you wouldn't have these benefits. Uh, in my experience, it's something that really more than comes naturally to one, as you walk light full speed. And what do you think about teaching it? Do you think it can be taught? Can be facilitated? I think so. Uh, I think, you know, like any virtue, I think, you know, modeling it is the best way of uh, doing it or uh, uh, hanging out with people who are good at it or reading the uh, works of people like Chesterton or others who just have a different way of looking at the world. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it can be. And so it's a part of character education uh, programs. You know, not all of them have gratefulness or thankfulness as a core uh, virtue, but a lot of them do. And they, of course, assuming it can be taught and modeled. Mm -hmm. A question and a comment. The question is, how do you explain the difference in results of the three? Of the three, yeah. And the comment is, actually, there is this kind of training. is in the world of, say, Ignatius. Uh, mm -hmm. 400 years, each day, he asked you right. to do an examine. That's right. The first point is great for me. That's right. Mm -hmm. Moral examination, yeah. Uh, I think some of the findings are because of the different time frames. So over two weeks, you're not going to see people change their health behaviors very much. They're not going to exercise more. They're not going to have um, um, fewer health problems. Not, the time frame is not long enough, okay? whereas we saw that over 10 weeks. Now, I don't know why it affected mood in one study, but it didn't in the other one. And, uh, of course, all the reviewers who reviewed the manuscript still want to know that, and can't answer the question for them either. But um, um, two and studies two and three look more similar, so uh, I think the daily studies tend to be a little bit more uh, have more consensus between them. Um, but the next thing we're going to do is with uh, married couples, we're going to look at marital satisfaction as a function of them each keeping gratitude journals, uh, probably separately, to kind of expand our uh, uh, dependent measures to go beyond the kind of self well being to collective well being. Well, I'm grateful you came to the talk. Thank you. <laughs>